Welcome to the National Soccer Coaches Association of America Winter Webinar Series. My name is David Newberry and I'm the coordinator of the NSEAA's Club Standards Project, an initiative designed to raise the performance of coaches and players one club at a time. Since May 2012, Since May 2012, we've had over 940 clubs join our project, representing 620,000 players and 53,000 coaches. The NSCAA is delighted to have Freya Coombe, Senior Lecturer in Sports Psychology and Coaching at Buckingham University, to present today's topic, Motivation and Building Competence in Youth Players. Freya is a senior lecturer in sports psychology and coaching at Buckinghamshire New, Col New University in England and combines working in sports science with soccer coaching and performance consultancy. He graduated with a bachelor's from Staffordshire University and a master's in sports science from Manchester Metropolitan University. Freya has achieved the UFB coaching license and has worked for Port Vale, Reading, Oxford and Chelsea. Freya has also been a football development officer for the English FA, a sports scientist and technical director for Reading Girls Centre of Excellence and associate trainer for Lane 4. She has also been an NSCAA convention, a convention clinician and published in the Soccer Journal. In 2013, Freya started Future Goal, a player-centered scholarship program focusing on female players. Welcome Freya. Thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to apologize as well for some of the background sirens that you may hear uh, throughout the presentation. My office is currently situated between a fire station and a police station so there's plenty of action in High Wycombe in London uh, at the moment. But thanks very much for um, allowing me to come and give this presentation to you. Um, I'm just going to start with just talking a little bit about uh, motivation. The topic of motivation is uh, a very popular and one that many pe people see as central to successful performance within sport. Quite often people see it as the coach's job to motivate their players, but ultimately it's the coach that sets the conditions for players to be motivated, rather than the co coach being directly responsible for that motivation themselves. So the highlight of today's presentation really is to look at how we can set that and create those conditions that will motivate our players and setting that motivational climate to help give people a positive experience within soccer. Um, I'll be grateful to any of you if you've got any questions, but I'll look to answer those at the end of the presentation. What we'll look at is um, motivation, and there are two different types of motivation that you might have. Um, quite often people refer to it as extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is looking at being driven by external factors. So for example, in soccer it might be winning a trophy. Um, it might be getting pr uh, praise from your coach that you're working with. So those external factors outside the person or the player. Intrinsic motivation is looking at getting pleasure and sort of being driven by the pleasure that you get from taking part in the activity itself. So whether it's playing the game, whether it's looking to be involved on a match day, etc. That's all the intrinsic reasons that you might be motivated. And we're going to focus on that intrinsic motivation. For the intrinsic motivation, it said that we're intrinsically motivated because of three factors. So you can see those up on the screen. The first one being autonomy. So as human beings, we're motivated by having this sense of self-determination or control over our own behavior. And that's a very important factor that needs to be present when looking at motivating other athletes or the players that we're working with. The second factor is belonging. So as individuals, we have a need to feel that sense of belonging with other people, to strike up relationships with others, and looking at having those relationships that allow us to work as part of a group and work together with other people. And the third area is competence. So we have a need and an innate drive to, um, to develop our competence and develop competence to show people how competent that we actually are. So if you think about uh, the areas of your life where you're really, really motivated, things that really appeal to you, the chances are that your motivations fit within at least one or two of these areas. So whether it's you know, something you do day to day, whether it's coaching itself, is there an area of this intrinsic motivation that you feel that you like to relate to? So whether it's developing your sense of competence, showing your competence to other people, 
have being part of that team, having that sense of belonging with the players and coaches that you work with. So that's where the intrinsic motivation factor comes in. If we're looking at where we get this sense of competence from, though, so what information do we get that gives us our area of competence? Now, this might change throughout our life. So if we're working with youth players, areas of competence might be related to things such as effort. But So, for example, if you're a young player, if you try really hard, you think you're really good at something. And that's sort of players around the five, six, seven age group. But as we get older, we get a better idea and a much more accurate idea about what competence is and how competent we actually are as players. So some of this competence information comes from these areas that are put up on the screen. So particularly objective measures, so this might be pass completion, shots on target. That might tell us how good we actually are at our performance. It could be the outcome of the game. It might be the selection as whether we're selected for that team or not. Our playing time or position. So are we feeling, being played in our favorite position or the position that we want to have? And are we getting, say, the full 90 minutes in that position or 60 minutes? Or is it that we're being moved around? And another indicator is our speed and ease of learning. Quite often working with players that they might see themselves as maybe getting the last 10 minutes of the game. So because of that and the situation that they've been put in, they might judge themselves as not being very competent. Oh, well, the coach only puts me on for the last 10 minutes. I never start a game. So they might consider themselves not to be one of the best players. So I'd like you to think about sort of how you can evaluate your own practice and how you can give your player sources of competence. So do you provide objective measures for them? So looking at stats over the period of the game. Is it that they're selected all the time or you get the same people that are on the bench? Do you rotate your players so that they share different positions? So these are just some things for you to consider throughout uh, the presentation. And the key thing is that they'll often get that information about their own competence from significant others. So with these, we refer to people such as your peers, um, so their friends on the team, their teammates, parents or coaches. Now, as coaches, it's our job through feedback to let them know about their competence. Okay, so areas for improvement and areas that they're really good at. So we need to be mindful of the feedback that we give to players as this is going to affect their competence and thus will affect their intrinsic motivation in time because players have this need to demonstrate their competence. Now, I just want to uh, direct your attention to the picture that's uh, up on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, sometimes there's areas that can um, affect a player's competence that might not be related to coach behavior or anything you can do anything about. So, for example, on this picture, I have taken a picture of some of the players from my under-15 squad. Now, these players are all the same age, and if you want to be really specific, if you go from light, left to right, that shows the age of the players but they're all the same age group within uh, school, within one age uh, year banding. And sometimes, quite often, looking at the competence of players, particularly at this age when they're going through vast changes in their growth and development, players might lose their sense of competence as a result of not how good they are technically as a player, but through things such as growth and how they can relate to their teammates. So in this picture, quite often, you might notice that we play bigger players. Well, actually, if we, don't, if we give players that are bigger more game time, then it might show that they're getting more greater selection, they're getting more playing time, their positioning's better. So quite often that might lead to smaller players who might need just need a couple more years to develop, to actually being forgotten about and not feeling as motivated or feeling as competent just because they're smaller. So we just need to be aware of that also within their growth spurts. So sometimes a player might be technically very good, might have been physically very uh, sort of accurate and very fit, but then they have a growth spurt and they need to learn how to work with their body, work with the changes that have happened to their body. They lose coordination during their growth spurt. Um, and then this might affect their competence because they can't move in the same way that they previously have done. So just something to bear in mind is looking at the growth spurt of your players, um, particularly sort of windows of opportunity. But we'll save that for another session. Just something I wanted to put in there just to remind you of. So looking then forward at sort of our sources of competence, very central to sort of competence motivation is achievement goal theory. Um, and this is looking at how we demonstrate competent within sport and how we view our success. Now, there are two different ways of viewing success. And one is called mastery, which is often termed as a task. Um, and the other one is performance, also referred to as ego. So if I start with mastery, uh, this is when an individual is motivated to master that situation or a skill. and their success is based on personal improvement and learning. On the flip side of that is performance, where success is judged on the outperformance of other people. So if we think about a 100-meter sprint, 
if you take the mastery approach, the player that, or the individual that's taking part in that 100 meter sprint will be looking for a good time and they'll be looking to get the quickest time that they can or the best time that they can. If you're looking at the performance environment or an ego environment, that player in the start line will be looking to outperform other people. They won't be too worried about their time, they'll just be looking on and focusing on winning the race. So there's two different approaches and two different orientations that we can look at with regard to our motivation. Now, if we're looking at this, why should we sort of take a mastery approach? Because that's what I'm really going to focus on this, this session, is how we can take a mastery approach and why it should be sort of central to our theory and going forward. If we're looking at the characteristics of mastery and ego oriented to players, so remember that ego and performance are the same. So mastery and performance or task and ego orientated players are the same things. If we're looking at positive behaviours, these take place in a mastery environment. So when we encourage and we set the conditions as coaches that success is all about being sort of and self-improvement, so being better than you previously have been, demonstrating learning. So this is the environment that we're talking about. We're also talking about an ego environment when the competence levels are high. So when the individuals have belief that they can succeed at a particular time. So within this environment, so a mastery environment and an ego environment when their competence is high, we generally find that players persist a bit longer. They set themselves more challenging tasks. So they might trial and error and try different things within the training session that will help, help them to succeed. They really engage in training and give their best effort all 100% of the time and they perform up to their potential on a consistent basis. What you might find on the flip side of that, so on the second column, is within an ego environment, so when the coach sets this environment or the conditions where they really value being outperforming other people. So that's what success is, is if you're better than your teammates, that's success for you. Now that's great if you're the best person. But if you have a low opinion of your own competence or a low perception of your own competence, i.e. you don't think you're as good as other people around you, then it might be consistent with some of these behaviours. So for example, if you know you're not the best, but the coach values that you're better than other people, that might give you a little sense of anxiety, and you might not be very confident about beating your opponent, which can lead for you to drop out in sport. So if you see your coach is valuing all the best players within the team, and you're not one of those best players, then you might sort of affect your self-worth and think, you know what, I'm not very good at this, I might go and play a different sport. It could be like you're more likely to blame others and cheat, now this is something that I have done in the past, particularly now with my age, still playing soccer with girls that are sort of 21, 19, they're a lot faster than me. If it's a case of having a foot race with these girls, I'm very ego orientated naturally, I might be more inclined to cheat and try and beat them by cheating because I know that I'm not going to do it. But working with youth players, this isn't the sort of behaviour that we really want to promote within soccer. We want people to try their best in self-improvement. Um, it could be that they drop out of sport completely, so maybe go and play another sport that they perceive themselves to be better at, or the coaches set different conditions. Or, this is an interesting one, that they choose related challenges that are too hard or too easy. Now, they might choose a really easy challenge because it's something that they've shown that they can be good at and they'll have success because they've completed that challenge. But interestingly, they also choose challenges that are sometimes too hard because they're not expected to have success at it. So it doesn't matter that they fail and everyone else in the group fails. Okay, it's because you know, they're not expected to have that success. So it's a case of protecting their own sort of sense of self-worth. And actually, they haven't tried a medium challenge that is maybe just going to stretch them a little bit. But actually, it's going to, you know, but they'll have success at it in the long run if they keep um, persevering at it. So sometimes it's safer and they protect their own identity by taking something that they're never expected to achieve, never expected to complete, and therefore they don't look silly uh, when they haven't completed it. So you can see that there's two positive environments, so the mastery environment and an ego environment, but only when competence is high. So if you're thinking about mixed ability players that you might have in your group, being the best can only really refer to maybe one, two or three players in your group. The others aren't going to be the best. So all the other players within your category will fall in that maladaptive behaviours if they're, if they're feeling that sense of a performance climate or an ego climate around them. So as a coach, it's really in your best interest to try and create this mastery environment that you've got around you. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't mean that players won't want to win the game. They will do that. But that it's looking to, for self-improvement and to create that in, in environment where mastery is key. So they're looking to learn and they're looking to improve all the time. If we're just looking at the next slide. 
doesn't seem to be turning to. Let me uh, just jump on there, see if I can get this full slide. How about that? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so we can see sort of two areas that we've got. So looking at creating this mastery environment and looking at creating a performance environment. So we can refer to it as the target approach, uh, with target the acronym that you see on the left-hand side. Within a target approach, a coach is able to distinctly uh, manipulate the environment to create this mastery environment or to create a performance environment. And this acronym will show you how you can change the environment at each little area to try and create that mastery environment where the athlete perceives that it's all about self-improvement and success is all about learning and skill development. When you've got that in place, then they're going to be intrinsically motivated and they're looking to take part and succeed. So looking at this area, um, first one that we'll look at is task. So it's important to consider the ability of all players when selecting talents and tasks, rather than a one-size-fits-all. So quite often in training, when you've got a large group and they're all at different levels, it's very easy to pitch it at the person or the middle level. So you've got the top people that need pushing that sometimes don't get pushed, and you get the people um, who are maybe at the lower ability level that don't get pushed enough, or the, sorry, the push is too much. So can you come up with a, in different activities or that will enable big people of different abilities within the group to be, part, uh, to be challenged? The second one, which I don't know how much is done, but it's something that I'll, since knowing about this area, I always try and do within my sessions, is to give players authority and to develop opportunities for leadership within the session. So allow players to make the decision on, in terms of which direction the session is going to go to. Give the players that opportunity to make decisions to organize the groups themselves, to get on and do the task. What do the players think is important to work on in training that session and why do you do it? You'd be quite often quite surprised at how accurate the players' perceptions of what's going on, the areas that they need to improve upon, um, and how accurate they are in terms of going forward. The recognition, it's very important to uh, recognize individual progress and try and do it privately. Rather than having everyone in front of the whole group, and talking about areas that they need to work on and where they've done well, try and have these conversations on a one-to-one -one basis with the group. Therefore, it's private to them. It's all about their own improvement, their own learning. Uh, this next one is grouping. So looking at providing opportunity to create different groups of mixed ability that focus on cooperative learning and peer interaction. Quite often, we'll just take people and take all the best players go in that group and all the worst players will go in that group or the lower ability players go in the second group. Whereas looking at being able to mix up, it could be that someone who is of lower ability would actually benefit from having one of their peers who's really good at um, whether it's a skill or a drill or technique coming and helping them, and showing them how to do it, what works for them. Because it could be that actually the coach, not saying we're giving wrong information, but sometimes it might be right for 98% of the group, but for those two players, they actually might need to do it a different way. So having players work together, it gives them that sense of autonomy, having control over what they do. It incorporates that belonging that we've got, and we mentioned in intrinsic motivation, and that will allow them to improve um, and to sort of show learning from that activity. Again, sort of allow players to evaluate themselves, and um, that's really important, and base all evaluation on improvement and effort rather than outcome and performance. Okay, so whether you know uh, you're asking them to do, for example, keep ups, asking them to come up and do some keep ups at the start individually as groups. OK, well, can you improve your score? And then asking players to feed back and evaluate whether they've improved themselves, rather than looking at, OK, who did the most in the group? Brilliant, have another go. Who can beat his score? Who can beat her score? OK, so looking at evaluation should be private and should be come from the player themselves. Again, the players really enjoy taking part in their evaluation. And the key thing as well is allowing time for individual practice and improvement. Quite often, we'll allow 20 minutes for everyone within the group to work on a particular skill. And then if they haven't completed it within that 20 minutes, it might be a case of, OK, we'll go home okay, and have a little practice. Or before you come to the session, can you do this? Well, actually, players all might need different times to spend on different activities. So can you build time into the session where the players arrive, whether it's 15 minutes before the session, whether it's at the end? Um, and you give that time, you allow time for that player to work on individual improvement. And it might be something that's related to the session but it might be something that's completely different. So the players that I work with all have a different goal that they need to work in, and some of them are similar to other people, so they might go off into groups of three at the start of the session, and it might be then they need to work on their agility for a little bit. I've got players that need to work on their first touch. So they split themselves up, and they spend time at the start of that session. They have 20 minutes every week, uh, sorry, every session every week that they allow to go and work on their own areas for individual improvement. 
So rather than seeing, okay, well, we've done that bit, now we need to move on, now we need to move on. So making sure we allow that time. So this will create a very mastery-led approach uh, to performance. And with that approach, then we can have uh, that positive effect on motivation. The other side I won't go into in too much detail because a lot of the time it's the opposite side of the mastery approach. So looking at performance, also known as the ego orientation or ego approach. So this is exactly the opposite. So this will very much try and promote that ego environment. Now it's important to note that the ego environment isn't bad. Okay, we do want to create that sense of competition. We do want people to look and see if they can perform better than other people. But what's the underlying factor is that this area of competence. That works for athletes who are all have the same high perception of their own competence. Okay, so then competition is good. But if you're working a very mixed ability group, if you've got players that aren't very competent or don't feel they're very confident about the way they play, setting this type of environment, a performance environment, is going to be detrimental for some of those players on the lower ability level. So just looking to summarize um, in this quick 20 minutes that we've had. It's important to realize that the coach creates the environment from which the athlete will be motivated. The coach isn't responsible for directly motivating the athlete themselves. We've got the two environments, the mastery and performance orientations, or the task and the ego performance orientations, as you may well read it. Um, and it's important that mastery comes through with all athletes, all the way through from grassroots athletes to Olympic athletes. Those athletes that are successful will have that ability to constantly strive to improve their own performance, constantly striving to improve and to try new things and be the best that they can be, regardless of the performance of other people. However, the performance environment, when you've got people that are at the same level of competency, you're going to want them to try and look to then outperform other people. So while they're carrying on and trying to strive for sort of perfection and looking at learning, you also want them to sort of have that element where they outperform others. But what's important is that that perception of their own competence is differential for the condition. So whether you approach a mastery or performance conditions. And the mastery approach, as we've seen, develops the positive behaviors. So it's this approach that we want to instill in youth participants. So making sure every time they turn up, they're trying to be the best that they can be, rather than doing the, le the least amount in order to just be the best within the group. So uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to uh, take them. I know it's a bit of a quick run through, we're a bit limited for time. Usually I could spend three hours talking about this, but that's a bit of a snapshot. If you do have any questions, I'll be happy to take them.